Good morning, happy Sabbath. Today we'll be reading from Luke 22, verse 14 to 16, and this is gonna be the new international version. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Have you ever wondered if it was your last meal, and you know it was your last meal, say you're on death row, you know it's your last meal, what would you order? I know. It would be blowfish. Now, I know a blowfish is unclean. I would never eat blowfish, but I know it would be blowfish. Why? Because if they don't prepare blowfish correctly, it will kill you. And that's the only time I would ever eat it, is if I knew I was already going to die. But if it's your last meal, you're probably not going to be thinking about food. You're going to be thinking about how it's your last meal. So it strikes me that Jesus says, I have earnestly desired to eat this meal with you. The definition of communion is the exchange or sharing of intimate thoughts or feelings, especially when the exchange is on a mental or spiritual level. As we enter into communica- uh, communion with Jesus right now, let's bow our heads and pray. Father, please prepare my heart and all of our hearts for this communion with you. I don't understand how you earnestly desired to eat this with your disciples when you were about to die. They didn't understand. Their hearts were prepared. Please prepare our hearts now. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. The last year was a pretty rough year for me. I uh, was sitting Friday evening, eating my supper. I just practiced singing for special music here. And I got a call from my stepfather that said, your mother's in the hospital. And I said, do I need to come? And he said, I don't know. The doctors are with her now. And uh, I'll let you know in the morning. The next day, he called me up and said, how soon can you get here? Your mother's on life support, and they're just keeping her alive until you can say your final goodbye. I hopped on a plane as quick as I could. I didn't do special music that morning because I was on a plane flying to see my mom for the last time. And I was praying like crazy. I got there and they said, well, we're just keeping her going and we'll pull the plugs and that'll be it. But we wanted to give you a moment or two with your mom. She won't be able to say anything. She won't be able to respond. She's kind of in a comatose state. So I just walked in there and held her hand. Just held her hand for an hour. They left me with her. And she started to respond a little bit. She started to blink. Well, first her hand started moving and gripped mine. I told her, Mom, I'm here. Then she started to move her eyes a little bit, and eventually she opened her eyes. The doctor came in and said, wow, she's doing pretty good. We'll see if we can take her off of these machines and see how she responds. And uh, they took her off the machines and, and she was able to talk and respond. All kinds of people praying. And the doctor came and told me, well, she's had a heart attack. The heart attack has killed half of her heart. 
there is no way that she can survive like this. Right now, there's a machine keeping her heart going. Said, we can try to remove that too, but most likely she won't make it after that. At the most, she has days. But I started talking with my mom, and, and I, I don't want to go you know, too much into the story. But my mom started talking to me about how she was struggling. Not so much with dying. By the way, she, she passed 10 days later, but I got to spend the last week with her. Or the last week of the 10 days. And she said, I, I, what I'm struggling with is I don't know that I'm saved. So I, I gave her all the promises. If, if you confess your sins, he is righteous and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. She says, I know. I said, have you confessed your sins? I have. She says, but I don't feel saved. I said, do you love Jesus? I love Jesus, but I don't feel saved. And I wanted to tell her all the right words to fix that, but I've struggled with the same thing. Am, am I alone? So I found out that the pastor was having communion with his church that week, and as an ordained elder, I said, do you mind if I take the grape juice and the bread and have communion with my mom? One last communion that Sabbath. And he said, oh, in fact, I'll help you out. I'll come and we'll have communion together with, you, with, with your mom. And I said, do you mind if I, you know, you can pray for the food, but do you mind if I present the little messagette? You know, it's not a sermon, but the little messagette. And he said, no, go ahead. So we prepared. And I started off with Luke. Started off with this Luke 14, or Luke 22, verse 14. And the hour had come, he said, and he was reclining at his table, and the disciples with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of heaven. And then I jump down to verse 24. As he's sitting there, you imagine the disciples are sitting there with Jesus for the last time. They don't know us the last time, but he knows us the last time, right? The disciples are sitting there, and they start arguing. It says, verse 24, And there arose a dispute among them as to which of them was to be regarded the greatest. By the way, this kind of broke out because a few days earlier, uh, James and John said, hey, we want a special request. We want to be on your right and your left when you enter glory. They didn't know what they were asking. They were asking to be crucified on the right and the left of Jesus. And Jesus says, no, you don't know what you're asking, uh, but you will be baptized with my baptism. James was the first to die, and John was the one to endure the insults the longest. So they were baptized with the baptism Jesus was baptized with. But this got the whole disciples arguing. This is the last meal, and their hearts weren't ready to accept it. The Tenth Commandment says, Thou shalt not covet. And right then, they were in the middle of coveting the closest spot to Jesus. So what did Jesus do? It doesn't say it in Luke. Let's, uh, the, the Last Supper is talked about in all four Gospels. But they each focus on a different things, right? Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke talk about the cup and the bread. John never does. John doesn't talk about the cup and the bread at all. None of those three, the first three, talk about the foot washing. That's what John focuses on. And why? Well, it's different messages to different churches. You look at when the books are written. Uh, Matthew and Mark are the first books written. 
So they're to tell the Jews, this is who Jesus is. He's the Messiah. He's given a new covenant. You don't have to sacrifice a lamb anymore. The bread and the wine are to replace it. John is the last book of the Bible written. And he wants to remind people, look, it's not just about the bread and the wine. There's another service. There's another part of the communion that's also important. So let's flip over to John. Chapter 13. Let's skip down to verse 3. This is during the argument. And Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, he got up from the supper. He laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself. He put the towel around his waist. This is too short to do that. I forgot I had an apron over there and I forgot to bring it up. And then he poured water, verse 5. He poured water into the basin. Thank you. Now, this was the job of somebody else. This was the job of the slave. The Jews were very big on having places of honor. Jesus would be in the greatest place of honor, and then his best disciples, who the, argue is, who the disciples were arguing which one it was, they would be to his right and to his left. The other disciples, other places. Do you guys know what the position was of the Last Supper? Judas was in the most honored position. He was to Jesus' left. John the one who loved Jesus, he was on Jesus' right. So they would be in the two most honored positions. Whose feet do you think that Jesus washed first? Judas. So as Jesus got down, he took off his outer robe to show that he is the Messiah. He took that off to serve. As he goes down and he bends down to wash Judas' feet, what do you think Judas' thoughts were? If Jesus is washing my feet, there is no way he is the Messiah. Jesus came to serve. And Judas didn't recognize that because his heart was on what, what advantage could it be of him? He said, this is definitely not the Messiah and his heart hardens. Jesus goes on and washes disciple after disciple. We don't really like the foot washing ceremony. You know when you get to communion, you have communion at a church, half the church is empty. We don't like it. It's humiliating. What is the foot washing ceremony all about? Why did John focus on it? And he didn't mention the bread and the wine. And yet the other three don't even mention the foot washing. What does the foot washing do for you? I would say it does two things. One, before Jesus got up and started washing people's feet, they were arguing about who was the greatest, who was the best, who was going to be in the best position. 
Then Jesus said, somebody is going to betray me. And they started asking, is it I? Not, is it this guy over here? They said, am I the one? Their heart switched from one of what is owed me to what do I need to do for Jesus? So the first one is to humble our hearts, to say, I need to serve like Jesus serves. You can see that if we go back to Luke. It was already there. Luke verse uh, um, 25. And he said to them, the kings and the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it is not this way with you. But the one who is the greatest among you must become like the youngest. And the leader like the servant. For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? It is not the one who reclines at the table, but I am among you as the one who serves. We are supposed to serve like Jesus serves. Our hearts need to be like Jesus to serve our neighbors, our friends. And until we humble ourselves, allow Jesus to humble us, we are not ready in our hearts to receive Jesus. Does that make sense? So that's the first thing that uh, the foot washing does for us. The second thing that it does for us, let's flip over to John again, John chapter 13. And it says, as he's washing the feet, it says, so he came to Simon Peter, and he said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus said to him, this is verse 7, Jesus answered him, what I do you do not now realize, but you will understand hereafter. And Peter said to him, never, never shall you wash my feet. Jesus said to him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not just my feet, but also my hands and my head. Give me a bath. And Jesus says, and this is so important, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Of course, he's talking about Judas. I always thought, and I was raised to think, that the whole plan of salvation was that you needed to come to the realization that you were a sinner. Once you come to the realization that you, need a, that you are a sinner, then you need to accept Jesus as your Savior. Once you accept Jesus as your Savior, you confess all your sins, he has wiped the slate clean. Then you as a Christian are, are, need to be baptized. Once you're baptized and you realize that Jesus has forgiven you, it is now your responsibility to keep the commandments. And if you don't keep the commandments you need to go through the process again. Confessing your sins, having Jesus sanctified, which means that if you're driving along and you've lived a nice, perfect life and somebody cuts you off in traffic and you swear at them, you honk your horn at them, and you crash into the guardrail and die, you are lost. That's a pretty harsh God. What does God say about that? And this is what I shared with my mom. Let's go over to 1 John. First John chapter 1. And verse 8. It says, if we say we have no sin, not had. Do you notice the tense in the word? If we say that we have no sin... We are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Right now, if I say I have no sin, I'm a liar, and the truth is not in me. 
So anybody that says, I am a perfect Christian, I am walking the perfect thing, uh, I, I am serving God perfectly, they are a liar and the truth is not in them. Anybody that says that they don't need Jesus right now because they are a sinner is a liar and the truth is not in them. Does that make sense? It says, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And then it repeats itself, number 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. I think the foot washing is the most beautiful portrayal of this. They had already been baptized. They had already decided, I want to follow Jesus. Well, I want to follow God. I am a sinner. I need a savior. They'd already come to that realization. They were already baptized. But, I don't know if you guys know this, but Jesus, except for one occasion, pretty much walked everywhere he went. And his disciples walked everywhere they went. Sometimes they took boats. But the roads are kind of dusty. They didn't have nice concrete and tar pavement, you know. And as you're walking, your feet get dirty. So, as the feet get dirty, they need to be washed. Jeremiah said, can a leper change his spots? They can't. Baptism is saying, I need a life change. But that can't happen without a creator. I need Jesus to recreate my heart. So the promise is that as you go down into the water, you have died to the old self. And when you raise out of the water, you are reborn into a new heart like Jesus. You see, Jesus did not have any propensity to sin. He was still tempted. He had the ability to sin. But he had a heart that didn't like sin. And that's what he promises to give every one of us, dead to the old self and risen to a new life where we have a heart that rejects sin like he does. But we're not going to have that immediately as soon as we're raised from the water. We were born in sin. We lived in sin our whole lives. And can a leper change his spots? No, it cannot. We need Jesus to come into our hearts and repeatedly, repeatedly bend down to serve us, reach in and wash our feet. It doesn't mean we have ever separated from Jesus. It means that we are still in that process of Jesus cleansing us. Does that make sense? So when we fall, it doesn't mean that we're lost. It means that one more time, Jesus bends down and washes our feet. To me, that is the most beautiful picture of how Jesus is continually serving us, continuing to bring our hearts closer and closer to him. And Jesus said, if we flip over to uh, Mark, I believe it's Mark. Maybe it's, let me look at my notes here. Mark chapter 12, I think it is. Ah, no, I'm sorry, it is Luke. Luke. Go back to verse 25. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who have authority over them. Luke 22, 26. But it is not that way with you. But the one who is the greatest among you must be like the young, youngest, and the leader like the servant. For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table, or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I 
and like the one who serves. And he gives a promise. You are those that stood by me in my trials, and just as my Father granted me a kingdom, I grant to you that you may eat and drink my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on the thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. He's giving a promise of a new covenant. Right now, we're the, the, the way he is instituting at the Last Supper is a new covenant. And he's saying, the covenant of having to kill a lamb is gone. Do the foot washing, drink the juice, eat the bread to remember me. But he says here, that's not the last covenant. The last covenant is what he's looking forward to where we're all in heaven and we're eating together. But he says, wait a minute, there's a challenge there. Verse 31, Simon, Simon. Behold, Satan has demanded, this version says, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have returned again, strengthen your brothers. We have an adversary, and this adversary loves to tempt us. And he tempts us for two reasons. One, he says, you know, if I get them to fall, then I can accuse them in front, of the, in front of God and say they're not worthy of going to heaven. But on you, he says, I'm going to get them to think that they're not worthy of heaven. That maybe they're lost because of what they did. And moreover, that they can never get over this. This continuous sin that he trips them up into. You're, you're not worthy to be a child of God. He is the accuser of the brother, and he wants to take every one of our hearts and sift it like wheat. Is Jesus, or I'm sorry, is Satan asking to sift my heart like wheat? Is he asking to sift yours? Is Jesus praying for my heart to say, no, this one is mine. Is he praying for yours? I have a little bit more to go, not much. But before we finish, I wonder if we could bow for prayer. Father, so many times my heart has not been prepared to enjoy what you have offered us. All of our hearts are born into selfishness. We're born into this, me first, what can I get? When you have offered us so much more than we could imagine, if we can just serve you and accept you died for us. You love us. You have already saved us. It's just up to us to humble ourselves. So please, we want this communion with, uh, with you. Please, and I'm going to ask every single person, don't raise hands. I don't, this is between you and God. Please forgive me for, and you fill in the blank. Father, we are your servants. We are your kids. Thank you for the gift of your son, and we can't wait for the new covenant. Until it comes, until Jesus comes, please remind us of the current covenant that whatever you've started in our hearts, you will finish. If we slip and fall, we have Jesus. We need you. We are sinners. Please forgive us. Please strengthen and renew our hearts to love you and to love one another. Please give us that assurance 
that you have saved us, that you are recreating us, and that you will take us home. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to close with this. After that communion, my mother did not have any problems with worrying about her salvation. She knew she was God's kid, and she couldn't wait to see him. And that's what I want for myself, and that's what I want for every single one of us. Let's go back to Luke to close. It said, verse 17, chapter 22 of Luke, verse 17, And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it amongst yourselves. For I say to you that I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until when the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some of the bread and gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, and after he had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. The foot washing is important, but this next promise, the promise of the bread and the wine, is just as important. He said the bread represents the body. When I take the bread, now remember, Jesus said he wasn't going to eat this. He's longing to eat this again with us. He wasn't going to eat it again until we get up there with him. But he asks us to eat it to remember him. He doesn't have any problem remembering us. We have a problem remembering him, right? But when I take the bread, this is not what I find in Scripture, but this is just me and my own heart. I take it and I put it in my mouth. And I hold it there for a while. I don't bite down right away because I don't want to. See, I realized that it was my sin that put Jesus on the cross. He was broken. He was be uh, beaten. He was crucified for my sin. I'm the one that put him there. And I don't want to cause Jesus pain. That bread represents his body that was broken. But I need Jesus. So eventually I bite down and then I can't stop chewing because I need Jesus so much in my life. I hate that I hurt him. But he gave his life for me. The wine, you know, the Jews were not supposed to drink blood. When he says the wine represents the blood of the covenant, they were supposed to have kosher food. They were supposed to drain the lambs. But now he says, this is my blood. The blood is the life. The bread represents the body that has died, the old self that has died. The blood represents the new life that goes in us. Jesus flowing through our heart, flowing through our veins, giving us a new heart, giving us a new life. Every time we take communion, it should remind us, I am a sinner. I need to serve like Jesus serves. I need Jesus to save me, and I need Jesus' life flowing through me.